Welcome to the No Name Brand Podcast. My name is Sashka Hanarapal, actress, singer, dancer, turned brand marketing sales and advertising strategist who brands your soul. And each week I bring you an inspiring person or message to help you discover your undergod. Turn up your leadership notches, challenge the status quo, because you're fast and furious with a powerful message to share with the world. Thank you for taking time out with me today. And without further ado, let's get our creative and wisdom juices for low wall. Thank you, everyone, for coming back this week and listening in on the No Name Brand podcast. This is your space where I'm researching and interviewing movers and shakers around the world who want to ensure that you are living the best life yet. And our next guest is certainly a new exception. The funny thing is that in order to live your best life yet, you need to accept that the life you've been living up to date wasn't or isn't a waste. Your life happened based on circumstances and choices, choices that led you on your life journey. Now, our next guest is a Hay House author of the book, Now Is Your Chance. She's achieved success that is unheard of in her industry through committing to making a big difference in our world by being bold and by working on herself every single day. Yes, please. Now, you as my listeners, you and I both know that we too are working on ourselves every single day. And yet, it may feel like you're still wading through the water with anchored balls on your feet. You know, those ball and chains. Why? This may be or could be for different reasons. But as our next guest would say, success, whatever that means for you without happiness, is not in fact a success at all, which is why she aims to catalyze your ability to live with more joy, fun, accomplishment, and abundance. And enjoy the choices you've made to move forward with speed, ease, and joy. Now, who wouldn't want some of that? So, without further ado, let me introduce the gorgeous and effervescent guest for today, Nick Pigeon. Hello, Nick. Hello. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Nick's now in Cape Town, my home country. Just found that out now. Pretty exciting. But it's not the accent. Where are you from? I'm from Newcastle originally, which is a city in the north of England. So about 14,000 miles away from where I am now. (laughs) And warmer. Lucky, lucky, lucky. (laughs) So so I was reading you won the award Young Entrepreneur of the Year and that you won your book deal with Hay House. So you win a few things in life where a lot may refer to that as luck. However, the likes of Oprah Winfrey and Denzel Washington say that luck is when opportunity meets preparation. How did you prepare for all this winning? Absolutely. It's something that I completely agree with because whilst these events and these competition wins might be seen as lucky, it's also the hard work that goes on behind the scenes that makes you that, almost like that overnight success that everyone sees on the outside. So for the Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award, I mean, that was something that was really, really special for me because I had no idea that I was going to be nominated and I had no idea that I was going to win it. And I remember on the day that I actually went to receive the award, I'd been working so hard in my business. I'd been running motivational events all around the Northeast and all around the world, really. But I'd been really struggling at the time with some personal challenges. So on that night of the award ceremony, my dad was coming to pick me up and I almost said to him, listen, I don't want to go. Like, I don't feel up to it. I'm exhausted. I just don't want to go. But I thought, you know what? Go along, celebrate, support everybody else. And when I got there, I could not believe when they called out my name. And it was a really special moment. It gave me a lot of confidence, that award, for sure. When was this? What, what year? It was back in 2015. It was a real symbol of really that, that moment of kind of coming out of the struggle and coming into this new place and space of being able to celebrate the hard work and be able to use that as a launch pad to go on to create something more. Mm. And I think that in every experience, whether it's a competition win or it's a, a new client or 
whatever it is that you're celebrating, you take strength from that and you take confidence from that. And it gives you that next level of your consciousness and your expression that you can really use to, to continue to grow from. That's so true. And was this for the business that you have now? Do you still have two businesses or was it for the one business? I have a few businesses now. This was for my very first business. So it was a motivational events company and it had like a wellness arm to it. And it was kind of when I look back, it was almost like my market research. So it was the <laughs> testing ground where it was like, this is everything that I love in the world. So I'm going to bundle it all into a business and really do my best. <laughs> and the thing is, it didn't work massively well for a few years. And it was hard and it was not making loads of money or some months it would make a lot and then other months it would make nothing. So it was like this emotional roller coaster of finances and like attaching your own self-worth to that. Mm. So it was facing the burnout, looking at the struggle and then understanding like that business had actually done to help others. So that's the reason that I won the award was because the business was very focused on contribution and on sharing and about helping other people. Wow. So with the Hay House book deal, that was something that was very intentional for me. So whilst the Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award was a surprise, the Hay House book deal was something that I'd had my eye on for a little while. So I knew I wanted to write a book, but being an academic and a scientist, I came out of my master's degree and I thought, right, this is it. I'm going to write a textbook, (laughs) (laughs) which would have been incredibly boring, I'm sure. But in 2014, I was gifted with one of the most painful years of my life. And I went through this huge process of healing and awakening and understanding. And I really realized the power of personal story to actually affect change in other people. Because through sharing stories, we all become so much more relatable. Whereas previously, I was this girl who had a few psychology degrees, who was happy and was telling people to be happy based on the theory, I was now this girl who had learned how to be happy, but then had also struggled with huge trauma and really had to put these tools and teachings to the test. So when I learned how to integrate my story and I learned the power of that, I realized that the book I wanted to write was really a combination of the theory, but also the practical application of positive psychology and how you can make your struggle your strength. So I started with a concept and I went to the writer's workshop in London. I actually went to the writer's workshop in Brisbane in Australia as well, because I knew I wanted to win the competition so much. (laughs) So I thought I'd go all the way around the world to give myself a second chance to enter. I entered both of the competitions and what you had to do was you had to write a book proposal. So that in itself, it's no mean feat because you have to understand what the problem is that you solve through the book the chapters, the structure, the marketing plan, what else is out there on the market. So it took about six months to actually put that together. And then I sent it off and then I waited. But I didn't just wait and hope and wait. I actually meditated hard on this outcome. (laughs) I made sure that every day I was visualizing and really bringing it inside of myself. I am a Hay House author. And everyone around me must have thought I was nuts. (laughs) I had it written down. People would give me, I remember my assistant gave me a card when I left the UK to start my location independence. And it said on it, to a best-selling Hay House author and six-figure coach. And I hadn't achieved either of those things at the time. And I was like, yes, this is me. Thank you. (laughs) When did you win the Hay House? So I entered in 2015 and I won it in 2016. So I literally, I remember I went to the Writers' Workshop in the March. I won the... Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award in April or May. I left the UK in the June, and then I found out that I'd won the next January. Wow. It's been about three years now since the whole process started. That's amazing. Oh, it's been since three years. That's Mm. amazing. Yeah, and everyone's like, oh, it's just happened overnight. What piqued my interest is you were doing a motivational events company. That's pretty interesting. Like you'd have event planning and stuff. It's because I love to speak. Now, I haven't always loved to speak. It used to be my biggest fear. Oh. But I really believe in facing into your fears. So when I was 17 or 18, I said to my teacher at high school, listen, I am so scared to get up at the front of the class. Can you teach me how to do it? And it became my greatest love. Wow. So I had this calling and this passion and this purpose to really share a message. 
So I started to run a series of events. So I used to run one every month on a Wednesday evening, which was called Power Hour. And it would be me teaching something from the science of post psych or from health and wellness. And then I would run one once a month on a Saturday, which would be a combination between Kundalini yoga and coaching. So they were my two things. And I just used to repeat them and repeat them and build them. And they were fantastic in the community in the northeast of England. But when it came to scalability, I was very limited in what I could do. Okay. And what was this business called? That was called Optimal You. And what are the other businesses that you have now? So I run a online coaching business. Mm -hmm. So that's my primary interest. I coach female entrepreneurs to create unstoppable success within themselves and their businesses. Mm -hmm. And then within that, there's a lot of different programs and projects. And then I also have interest in other businesses such as online women's network, other coaching businesses that I have an advisory role in. So the coaching side of things has definitely been something that I've moved more into in recent years. What made you become an entrepreneur? Like what pulled you towards it? You got the taste of it when you were very, very young. It sounds like that freedom because entrepreneur is all about freedom and being your own boss and painting your own picture and all that glam stuff. But like you said earlier on, there's the whole going through the cycle and learning who you are and what you represent. And for me, I work from the place of finding what your purpose is because your career can be anything and bringing that through. So why entrepreneur or why self-employed? It's a great question. It's actually, my partner asked me last night, he said, you know, Nick, if you weren't doing what you're doing now, what would you be doing? And I said to him, do you know what? There's no way that I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now because I've created this whole life based on what I love. I mean, sometimes it gets hard when someone says, what are your hobbies? And you say, kind of put all the hobbies into a business. (laughs) So (laughs) from a young age, I mean, at school, we ran a project in England called young um, enterprise and I was director of that school business when I was in my teenage years so I had that interest for like learning the model of entrepreneurship and being able to learn how to delegate and those sides of things I think even younger than that I was always very headstrong Mm -hmm. so I was always very independent I wouldn't say that my parents have been majorly influential on me because they both had jobs But what I was great at was looking at the people that I admired and learning from them. So for example, my ex-boyfriend's dad, sorry, was an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So I used to learn from the way that he did things and learn things from his mindset. And that really helped me to grow. So I think it's not always the people that you expect to give you the guidance. It's about looking for the, the opportunities around you and seeing what else is out there, whether it's a book or a person or a mentor or wherever you can learn from, just ask questions and observe. I mean, entrepreneur, I believe the entrepreneurs that succeed the most are those with the highest survival skills where you're thrown Mm. into the deep water and it's like, well, there's only one way to survive and this is the way. And we don't get taught this. It's intrinsic and it comes to the surface when we put under a lot of pressure. Were you yourself put under pressure to go, okay, I'm going to make this work? Starting a business is easy. Anyone can go and open a business, even here in Austria, where there's so many rules and regulations, you can still open your business, but it's keeping it and sustaining it and keeping it consistent over the years. That's the thing, because like you said in the beginning, it wasn't working, it's hard, and you've got to change your mindset work and go from there. Resilience is a hugely important thing. So whether it's business or it's happiness or it's success, resilience is the thing and having that grit and that determination to keep on going is what's going to make the difference. I've been on this path for 10 years now. Now, if you look at other people that started something 10 years ago, are they still doing the same thing? Like a lot of people wouldn't have the commitment or the vision or the necessarily the just making those choices to, to continue when times get tough. And sometimes it is tough. A lot of people see the, the shiny outside and they see like, oh, Nick's on stage and she's speaking in Miami or she's in LA or she's doing these amazing things around the world. But they don't actually see what happens when you're in the day to day, when you're tired, when you're jet lagged, when things aren't going your way, when you launch something and it doesn't work, when you test something and it goes wrong. It's all of this stuff that builds up the bigger picture. So you have to develop your strength of character as well as the skills in your business. And you need to become the person that can hold that new level of responsibility. Now, in every phase of growth, you required a different level of self-belief and a different mindset. And when I started in business, it was just me. So the challenge was, how do I make money? 
How do I get clients? How do I promote myself? Now we have a team. So we have, there's around about seven people that work for me in the business. And that's a different ball game because now you've got, okay, so what is their vision? Who do they have to support in their family? What is it that they are good at? What is it that they enjoy doing? And then all of a sudden, you're not just building this business and vision for yourself, but you're building it for your community, your audience, your clients, your staff as well. And it becomes a lot more responsibility. And sometimes that responsibility weighs heavy on you, but you've got to have these processes and you've got to have things that you can do to make yourself feel better, to remind yourself what you're grateful of, to understand that you're in an incredibly fortunate small percentage of the population that can even have these choices. So it's an amazing place to be in and you've got to be grateful for the hard stuff as well as the easy stuff as well. That's so true. What's the hardest thing or decision you've had to make in your life during your business and your life? It's really hard to need to fire staff. <laughs> that is something that will, is never going to get yes. easier. Yeah. When you're a nice person, you've got to make that decision and have that conversation. I mean, hard decisions. You make hard decisions every single day. Some of the hardest things can be the small decisions. So it can be like, okay, so how do I actually motivate myself today? How do I actually, do you know what I mean? Those small things. How do I make sure that I actually do this thing that I say I'm going to do, which is going to move my business forwards? I think that sometimes those things can actually be more challenging than the big decisions. Mm. If I think about and reflect on a huge kind of game changer direction pivot point that I've had, it was probably back in 2015 when I'd left the UK and I'd taken my business location independent and my assistant and I had launched a new online group coaching program. And that group coaching program had sold one place and that's not a group. <laughs> so I was faced with this decision. Do I go all in on this thing which seems to be not working but I know feels so true for me inside of myself? Or do I listen to everybody else on the outside that's saying, you cannot do this. What you need to do is conserve funds, get a job, be stable, do this for a year, and then maybe return to your business. And do you know what? I thought my intuition is always going to be the right way to go. It's always going to serve me well. So I'm going to follow what I think I should do. And if it doesn't work out, then I can do something else. So I went 100% all in on the business. And in that month of making that decision, I generated $35,000 wow. in that first month of business. So for like a change in perspective, that was a hard decision to make, but it was absolutely easy at the same time. Because when you have that knowing and that fire inside of yourself, nothing can, uh, can take you off that course. That's so true. You're on such a high. It's, it's a real, for those that are listening that haven't reached that yet. Do you have in your mind at the moment that snowball effect where it started and how it started snowballing towards, I don't want to say success because it's how each of us see it, but the point at where you are now, how, where you've reached now. So what were the processes you were going through? Definitely work harder than you think you need to work. <laughs> like you cannot get away from the need to actually put in the effort and don't be disheartened if things don't work immediately. Like we have clients in our coaching programs who will launch something like I did in a month that will be super successful. We also have some who take a little bit more time to get clear on their message or their intention. And everybody's process is absolutely their own. So don't get disheartened if it takes you a little longer than someone else. And don't compare yourself to those other people. Just know that what's occurring on your journey is meant for you. Mm. Um, I definitely worked very long hours. I mean, I worked from 6 a.m. till 10 p.m. most days. And I continued to put out content on the front end so that people could understand what I was doing. It was scary at first because I didn't want to be visible. I was almost embarrassed. And I thought, what are all my friends from school going to think of me? Oh, wow. Ooh, I was really nervous. And I'm sure that some people listening as well will really resonate with that feeling. Mm -hmm. But once I got over that, it was just consistency of putting out and sharing what I did and what I could offer people. And I think once you get over that, that almost like critical mass, it really does start that momentum and that snowball effect that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Because people have then absorbed the message and they know it and you're the go-to person for that thing that they need. The thing that we need, speaking about us ourselves, did you invest in yourself in a mentor as well or yeah. in men mentors or was it just one person or were you more self-guided, self-reliant? 
I've invested over the past two and a half years more than $200,000 wow. in mentors and coaches. Now, when I was younger, like I mentioned, my mentors and the people that guided me were friends' parents. Mm. And I didn't obviously pay for that at all. But when I really decided that this was 100% what I needed to do, I knew that the money was the currency of me stepping up and making this new commitment to myself. Mm -hmm. So I actually made a huge investment. I invested everything that I had, plus I had to borrow 800 pounds, so about $1,100 from a friend who said, listen, I believe in you. I know you can do this. So I made this huge investment with my hand shaking with my, my card and <laughs> From now, I've continued to invest because I believe that working with a mentor or a coach will always shorten your learning curve. And if you can see someone that either has a mindset or a skill set that you can learn from, mm -hmm. then absolutely do it quicker, do it faster, work harder than anyone else, and you'll get where you want to go. What do you see is the difference between a mentor and a coach? The terms are used interchangeably now. Mm -hmm. In the traditional sense, a coach would be somebody who questions and allows the client to offer their own thoughts and response. Mm -hmm. A mentor would be somebody that guides a lot more. So for example, if I, I um, had a, a client that said, Nick, can you tell me exactly the three steps that you use to create your business and your success? And I said, okay, I did this, this, and this. So this is what you need to go away and do. That would be more advisory and it would be more of a mentorship role. But the work that we do in the business, we actually find that a blend of both works. Because you want your clients to think for themselves. Yeah. So you want to do coaching, but you also, you know the system. So you also want to teach and mentor as well. Mm. Yeah. How do you see the world? Like in colors or matter or form or atoms or air? Like how do you see it for yourself when you're walking down the road or in Cape Town when it's so freaking sunny and we're stuck in the snow? No! Like I see it as the matrix, me personally. How do you see the world? I see the world in vision, mainly. So, I mean, a lot of people, including my mum, will say that I live in a dream world. <laughs> and sometimes you'll see people and they'll say to you, they'll be like, Nick, Nick. I'm like, oh, sorry. And I was literally thinking about, okay, so this is something that I'm going to create or this is how I want this event to go. So I'm very focused on vision. And I think that's why I've been fantastic at manifesting what I want to create. But the world for me, it's, I see it through childlike eyes. So I look at things, I'm like, oh my goodness, look at that. Like, look at that butterfly. Or isn't it amazing how this coconut just grows? <laughs> so I think when you approach it with a childlike curiosity, you're able to actually absorb so much more of the richness that we have around us. Mm. I remember sitting, you reminded me of something when I went to, it was high school and catching the bus to school. And I used to love daydreaming awake. That, and I forgot mm. about that for a long, long time. And recently my kids were doing it and I was like, I used to love that. Just sitting there and going off and daydreaming, but you're wide awake. And exactly like, hello, hello, are you there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm here. Did you see the world that I just went into right now? Those are where the seeds are planted. And then how it happens, we just don't know. Just going from there. You spoke early on about the woman that you serve. I like to go a little bit deeper. So your soul group, can you tell us a little bit more about that soul group of women? Like what kind of woman are these? So it's a woman that knows that she's meant for more. Mm -hmm. So she has this feeling inside of herself, but she doesn't necessarily know the steps to get there. Like a big piece of my work is around empowering women. So I work with United Nations women and I'm an ambassador for one of their campaigns to end violence against women. So that's a really big piece for me. And I see entrepreneurship as a vehicle to help empower and to help women create joy. I think it's such an amazing unfolding of strength when you see someone that is confused or is playing small mm -hmm. to actually allow themselves to grow and expand and reach this higher level of consciousness and this higher level of service doing something that they love. So for me, it's a, a woman that has a, an intention to create impact and an influence through doing meaningful work in the world, but that doesn't necessarily know how to do that just yet. Yeah. How do you recognize this in someone that when you first meet them and how do they recognize that in themselves? And how did you come to this summary of who you want to serve? Mm. I'm really big on like feeling. So like feeling the energy of another person or feeling the energy of a conversation or 
the energy of and like the direction of like a line of questioning and curiosity. And I feel like there has to be a willingness both from me, obviously as a leader, but a willingness from those women that are ready to step up and do the work. And that doesn't necessarily have to be in a coaching environment. It could be someone that picks up the book and by actually buying the book or by listening to the audiobook online, it's a choice that you're making. It's that first step, that first positive intention that can really make the difference. Mm-hmm. So it's almost like the women that I work with really select themselves because they have to be in a, in a certain space and frame of mind already to decide, you know what, the way things are at the moment, that's not enough for me. And I want something more. Mm. So I'm going to go and find out what it is that I can do to actually create something more today. That's a huge thing, especially that ripple effect. So it's one person goes to the next person, goes to the next, and it just becomes stronger. Which brings me to my next question, which is that you do applied positive psychology. For a long, long time, the perception of psychology was anything but positive, Mm. let alone applied. When did this come about, this inverted commas title? of applied psychology, positive psychology, because most probably think, yeah, it's for quacks and can't go in the mentally disordered, you know, depression and stuff like that. So what are you doing? Most coaches go and do NLP. So it's also a form of psychology, but it's more mindset and some say it's more manipulative and so forth and so forth. So how are you using that? Or have you created your own signature program? How did you involve that in your business and in your life? I think all of the disciplines are valuable and I always encourage people not just to learn from me or not just to learn from one area, but to explore different practices and different modalities and see what helps you and see what works for your clients as well. PodSight came about as a counterbalance to what we call psychology as usual. And when I go to a wedding these days, I still get asked, oh, so you're a psychologist. Oh my goodness, are you <laughs> analyzing me right now? I'm like, I wish I could be bothered to analyze you when I'm here at the wedding, just trying to enjoy my day. But no, it's slightly different. So positive psychology is all about human strength. And it's the, the study of happiness and what we actually do well as humans, rather than what's going wrong with us and what's going wrong with the world. So while some people are like, yeah, it's quackery or it's pseudoscience, it's actually a a real life science it's grounded in statistics and evidence and testing and research so that's what makes it slightly different from your positive affirmations or your positive thinking it includes that as well but it's actually the proven science so that's what's slightly different and that's what really appealed to me because having this academic background I thought right okay I can look at why we feel good and how we can feel better but also have reason behind it as well and I think that's why the, the book has been so celebrated because it brings in the kind of girl next door story of how I got happy, but it's also, okay, so these things are real and proven and this is why you should do them and how you should do them too. Yeah. You're talking about all this positiveness and when I was going through your social feed on Instagram, I mean, pretty much every photo, you smiling and it's all happy, happy. <laughs> and a lot of people go through and go, oh, she looks so happy. And it's like, why is she smiling? Like, seriously, does the woman ever have a freaking bad day? Like people just want to have that. It's intrinsic in us, the good and the bad. And then you really want to be happy for someone, but you're not really. When you're having those bad days and you mentioned it before and you think, how am I going to pick myself up? How am I going to motivate myself today? Whatever it is. What is your plug in to go to lift yourself up? My go-to is absolutely gratitude. Mm. So I have a mindset journal and I will get it out. I'll put on some of my favorite music and I will just write a full page of things I'm grateful for. And the power of that shift is enough to actually transform the way that I think and feel. The other thing is movement. So exercise, like those two things, absolutely. And it's funny because I got asked to do a photo shoot for women's health not so long ago. And they said to me, Nick, it's a really kind of poignant piece. It was about mental health. And they said to me that you need to, in the photo shoot, you need to have a serious face. I was like, oh my goodness, how am I going to do this? So the photographer was like, okay, okay, a bit more serious, a bit more serious. (laughs) And I was like, I can't do it. I was laughing my head off. So we ended up with all of these happy photos and then a few really awkward, serious (laughs) ones as well. That's amazing. So just, it just flows from you. It's just a natural state with you. Yeah, I just, I do find it easy to be happy. And I feel like it's not because of the job that I do. It's just something that I'm 
Like, I love making other people feel happy. I believe that you're responsible for how you show up in a relationship or a conversation. So rather than being the miserable person and actually ruining someone else's day, why not be the person that smiles and says hello Mm -hmm. and actually gives a bit of joy to someone else? That's so true. That's so true. Where do you see yourself being in your next phase in your life? Because there's, I always say there's three phases in our lives. Not many people reach the third phase. Some people might get to the second phase. But that third phase sometimes or often has nothing to do with what you're actually doing now. Do you often see the vision of over and beyond where you are now? Like I love doing my live events and I'd love to scale them. So the biggest audience I've spoken in front of is about 2,000 people. Wow. I'd love to do 10,000 or 20,000 and have big arenas. Oh. Like that is a huge vision of mine. I really love the TV work that I do and I'd love to do some more of that. And I love the book as well. So I plan for many more best-selling books. Oh, so awesome. it's the same path, but it's just the old lady who is 100 years old that's doing, doing it in the future instead. <laughs> I love it. So now I want to get to the book. So tell me about the book and how you were planning it and the marketing plan that you were talking about earlier on. Did that actually come to fruition when you, because you proposed that or did Hay House go, eh, let's maybe do something else or tell us about, and tell us about your book. Yeah, so that was the marketing plan, that side of things, that happened, but it also evolved into so much more. So when I entered the competition, the book proposal looked very different to what the book looks like now. And that's because your process of writing a book is an evolution and you have to be prepared for the book to change as you grow. So it changed from a 12-chapter book to a 30-day guide. 30-day guide to living your happiest life using positive psychology. And my intention is that there's a tool or a teaching every day for the 30 days that you can take away and practically put into practice in your life. So we're all busy. Sometimes I find it hard to read a chapter of a book at a time. So these are two, three, four pages. So there's no excuses. (laughs) And we took the marketing plan. Like we had the platform, which was small three years ago. It was maybe... 7,000 followers on Instagram or 1,000 on Facebook. And we've really scaled that. So I now have access to almost three quarters of a million people across all of our different social platforms. So it's about setting the intention and looking for where you want to go and how you want to grow. Mm. So the marketing plan almost opens up the, the vision for what you want to create. And the book's been fantastically well-received. We've had celebrations from huge influencers like Brendan Burchard. We've been featured in Women's Health, Marie Claire, Psychology's Magazine. We've done TV, we've done radio. So it really has been a fantastic journey. And it's been one that I realize is only just beginning. I'm very good at starting things and saying yes to things. And I've realized that with the book, it's about really... It's never finished. Your book's never done. But it's about consistently sharing it and understanding that that message is going to be shared by word of mouth. Somebody's going to see someone reading it on the beach. And the objective of the book is to get the tool in the hands of the people that really need it the most. So my goal is to sell millions of copies. Yes. (laughs) Go, go, Nick. And we're all going to support it. We're going to put it in the show notes so people can also find it and... I know I was just about to purchase it and I was like, oh, I've got to do the podcast. I can't go do it now. <laughs> so I'll do that as well. Thank you. The audio book. I'll do the audio book because I love listening to it when I'm going on walks, listening to books. So we're coming to the end. It goes so quick. Time goes really, really quick. And I ask all my guests uh, two questions for them to answer. The first one being on three of my values and you filling in the blank of what they are for what they mean for you. So creativity for you is inspired thought leading to action that's good I like that it's gonna make me think now <laughs> wisdom for you is oh your sense of intuition and knowing from your, your your connectedness i love that passion for you is that thing that lights you up and drives you forward i love that how do you want to change or challenge the world doing what you do I have a commitment to really changing perspectives, to showing what's possible for anyone. I've been through some of the most horrendous things that a human can go through and come out of the other end of it stronger, happier, and shining brighter. So I really want to allow people to see what's possible and then 
help them with the steps to actually do that for themselves as well. You're such a positive person. <laughs> like, oh my God, <laughs> you just exude it. It's amazing. I actually, we have to take a screenshot and then just like, this is Nick. <laughs> no serious faces over here. Thank yeah. you so much for all that passion and creativity and wisdom that you've shared with us today. Thank you for following your intuition and honoring it and for being grateful for it and not ignoring it and inspiring not only women, but young women as well and being an ambassador as well. Thank you for doing what you do and thank you for being with us here today. And we'll find out more about you in the show notes as well. Quotes, books, everywhere, everyone can find you. And hopefully as well, we'll get to see you live soon, speaking as well in front of 20,000, maybe even 50,000 people. Hell, let's make it 100,000. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go from there. Thank you very, very much, Nick, for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure. Have an awesome day from that wonderful sun and hopefully the water, you know, the droughts stop soon. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'll speak to you soon. See you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Dang, that was just super califragilistic expialidocious. I enjoyed having you on board and please do me and you a favor. Head on over to iTunes, SoundCloud or Stitcher. Click subscribe and a super bonus. Leave your review and you stand a chance of being announced and advertised on the show. I'm always striving to ensure that your brand is uplifted and empowered. Remember, done is better than perfect. So be sure to subscribe, leave a review, and send in your feedback too. You're the absolute best. Keep rocking.